uh, kids that won't get right. Lord, you made this day. God, above all the circumstances, you made it, and we should rejoice and be glad in it, Father. God, will you help us to do that today? Help us to put aside the uh, things that uh, come against us, Lord, and uh, just focus on you, God, to worship you and praise you and to learn from you. Uh, God, I pray that you'll uh, meet the prayer requests that were mentioned here, those that are sick, those that are out traveling, God, and uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll uh, go before those and, and meet those needs, Lord. Uh, God, uh, uh, I love you, Father, and I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for how it's alive and, God, how it's sharp, Lord. And, God, I just pray you'll open it up to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, I'm going to read all these verses again. I hope that doesn't bother anybody, but uh, I enjoy reading it because uh, from week to week we can forget some of it. Uh, and, and also tying it all back in together. I think is, uh, is super important. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. There's a whole lot to be said right there. So often we try to be strong in our might. We try to be strong in ourself. But the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and where we'll be today, the sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God. So just as a reminder, we, we started this series, uh, Lesson 1, we didn't even talk about a piece of armor. Lesson 1, we talked about the charge, and we talked about the warfare, and we talked about the enemy. We talked about the duty of the soldier and, and, and what it means to be in God's army and how once we're saved, we're there. You don't have an option. You choose salvation, you choose Jesus, uh, then you're choosing uh, to, to go to war. You're choosing to battle. You're choosing... Uh, to put on that uniform, to put on that cross, to, 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 to go where others won't go and to do what others won't do. And then over the last uh, five weeks, we have went through each piece of armor individually and how important uh, each piece of armor is to our life and, and how every single piece of armor, uh, by the time it's said and done, the application of that armor, it all ties back to this book. It all ties back to uh, how we use this Bible. And then Paul fittingly sums up the armor of God with, with this piece today, the sword of the Spirit. And we talked about the, the first three pieces being those pieces that we have at all times. The, uh, uh, the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and having our feet shod with the preparation, having that good foundation under us. And then we've talked about uh, those next uh, three things that we would take when we would need it, that shield of faith and that helmet of salvation. And then finally today, that sword of the Spirit that you take when you need it. We compared that to a softball player or a baseball player using certain parts of their equipment at certain times and how uh, they wouldn't use a bat out in the outfield and they wouldn't wear a glove uh, at the home plate trying to, trying to hit a home run. just wouldn't make sense. And when Paul wrote this letter, he was sitting in prison, a Roman prison, looking at Roman soldiers in Roman armor. And God took that and gave him a message out of it. Man, I just love it. And I know God does this for everybody. But I love it when God will take something physical that's right in front of me that I can see and put spiritual application to it. I, I love it when I, can, when I can hear about uh, 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 something that I do 
with my hands, whether it be uh, rebuilding a trailer for Mr. Ray and God speaking to me about restoration, or, or whether it be about reading what Paul saw here. And if we're careful, there's no telling how much I've missed, right? There's no telling how many jobs I've done that I busted my knuckles on or that aggravated me. There's no telling how many criminal cases I've been involved in that just drove me crazy. And all along, I missed the spiritual meaning to it. I don't think there's a day that goes by in our life that God don't put some physical something in our way in order for us to gain spiritual wisdom from it. I don't care if you wake up every morning and go from your bed to your couch and from your couch to your bed. At some point during that day, God is going to give you something physically in front of you that you can make spiritual application to. The key is, are you looking for it? Are we looking for that spiritual application? Are we trying to find that for ourselves? Today we're going to focus on that sixth and final piece of armor, the sword of the Spirit. We learned about truth, right? That very first piece of spiritual armor, the belt of truth. And then we talked about that breastplate of righteousness, keeping our feet protected. Uh, we put on truth, we put on righteousness, and then we remain ready. And then the Bible goes on to tell us about focusing on that shield of faith, that shield that the soldier takes uh, to guard his body against uh, uh, those darts that come from the devil. And just as a reminder, not some of the darts, all of the darts. And not just all the regular sissy darts, but the fiery darts, the big ones, the bad ones. That shield will help us with. And then uh, we, we talked last week about that helmet of salvation, that helmet that protects our mind uh, from the things that, that, that Satan would try to trick us with and get us all messed up with. Has anybody had an opportunity this week? I know I have, and, and, and you're not bragging on me if you agree with me, but I've had an opportunity several times this week because of last week's lesson to remind myself, where's your helmet at today? You're letting this get to you and it shouldn't. You're, you're letting this, this affect you and it shouldn't. Your helmet's not strapped down tight. And I'm thankful for those reminders. And today we're going to talk about uh, the one weapon that God gives us along with all this armor. That one weapon being the sword of the Spirit. So after putting on all the armament, everything's tight, everything's ready to go. The belt's on tight, he's got his breastplate fitted just right. Uh, his shoes are strapped up and ready to go. He's got the right shoes on. He's taken that shield and checked it out and made sure everything's good with the shield. He's got it by him. He's got his helmet on and ready to go. Very last thing he's going to do is find his sword. He's going to pick up his sword. That law enforcement officer, uh, everything is the same. It's crazy. Two thousand years, you know, two thousand years later, or, or almost two thousand years later, uh, from when Paul wrote this, the law enforcement officer does the same thing that the Roman soldier done. He puts his belt on. He puts his vest on. He puts his boots on. He, he, he grabs that shield, that badge. He, 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 he's got his helmet. And the very last thing he does is he secures his weapon in his holster. For the soldier, the sword is the weapon of choice. It's the weapon of choice to both defend against the enemy's attack and to also attack the enemy. You can use your sword both as a, a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon. And the soldier, he don't trust just any sword. The soldier don't just walk up to the corner and find a pile of swords laying there and just grab one and go. The soldier's going to use the same sword that he uses in his basic training. It's that sword that he's used to. It's that, uh, uh, that sword that, 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 that he made sure the length was correct. The length was correct for the soldier's sword. Too long and it made it too heavy, right? Too short and he would get stabbed before he could get somebody else, right? Uh, um, the handle, if it, the grip was too big, right? Warren, you ever tried to bowl with a seven pound bowling ball? They don't make them with finger holes big enough for me and you, do they? They just don't. 
So we got to get the 15 pound bowling ball, you know, because they think we're all a bunch of, you know, whatever, walking around. We got to hit the heavy one. You got to have the right equipment. The soldier had to make sure it was sharp enough that it fit his hand right. And after all that, he spent all the time in the world training with that weapon, making sure he knew how to use it. But just as importantly, listen to me, making sure he knew how not to use it. Do you know you can use this sword the wrong way? Yeah. If you ever quote scripture to anybody and you end it with nanny nanny boo boo, you're doing it the wrong way. Or if you end it with I told you so, you're doing it the wrong way. Or if you do it with any selfish or prideful motivation, uh, you're doing it the wrong way. Think about our softball player that we've been talking about. She doesn't put on all her gear. My favorite softball player in the entire world is Madison Dennis. If you've never watched that girl play softball, spend the $7 for a ticket and go watch her. She is amazing. She is amazing. But she don't spend all of her time out in, at shortstop fielding ground balls and throwing them to first base. She's great at it. Man, I think she could hit a fly from 100 yards with a softball. She's great at that. But she can't spend all of her time doing that. She can't be out there catching pop flies. She can't be out there doing relays the whole time. She has to spend an equal amount of time at home plate swinging the bat. She has to spend just as much time uh, making sure that she can keep her eye on the ball and put that ball where it needs to go. You can't win a ball game without scoring points. You can't uh, 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 score points if you're not good at the plate. So she has to practice and practice and practice. In the off season, she practices. In the rain, she practices. When everybody else is at prom, she's practicing. When, when, when everybody else is running around doing whatever teenagers do, she's practicing. And it's not good enough that your bat hits the ball. Uh, when, when they get up to her level of, of talent, it's not just making sure your bat can hit the ball. It's making sure you can put that ball in right field. Making sure you can put that ball in left field. Making sure you can put it in the air or a ground ball or just a little looper over the second baseman's head. They practice technical hits. They get real deep in it. It's not good enough in, in your walk with God that, that you just learn how to read a scripture you got to be able to apply it in different ways for the battle that's in front of you a law enforcement officer he don't graduate uh, the police academy and get this brand new shiny Glock 40 caliber pistol and they just present it to him in a shiny case and say here here's your weapon now that you've done everything else here's your weapon go out and do good no that's not how it works he gets that weapon pretty close to day one. That weapon's uh, with him in everything he does. He spends weeks and weeks getting to know that gun. Weeks and weeks learning the ins and outs of it, cleaning it, most importantly, shooting it. Not only is he improving his proficiency with that weapon, but he's becoming more comfortable with it. The more you handle a pistol, a, 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 a weapon that's capable of, of taking the life of someone, the more you handle it, the more comfortable you get with it. I, I've, I've helped people uh, with firearms before. I've helped people purchase their first firearm. I've helped people uh, uh, learn the ins and outs of their first firearm. And it's amazing. Week one, it stays in the case, right? And they keep it in the top of the closet and the bullet's way over here somewhere else. And, and all that's safe and stuff. But after you work with them for a while, the next thing you know, they've got that firearm where they need it. They've got it loaded, ready to go. They're comfortable with it. They're not scared of it anymore. We're able to uh, uh, take it, shoot it, learn it, use it, clean it. It's not just enough to know what size bullet goes in your gun. You've got to know how to get that bullet out if it jams. I'm making spiritual application here. I hope y'all are catching what I'm throwing at you. you. You got to know how to clean it when it gets dirty. 
And that means taking it apart sometimes and dissecting it. You, you got to know uh, if your sights are off a little bit so you can get that problem fixed. The very first question they asked me in the police academy about two weeks after they handed me my firearm, what, in, what caliber is it? How good are you at shooting it? They looked at me and said, what's the serial number to your firearm? And buddy, you better be able to quote it back to them. The only way you know how to quote it back to them is you've been paying attention to your firearm. You've been looking at it. They want you to take it apart, put it back together, take it apart, put it back together. Are you taking this apart and putting it back together? Are you studying it for you? I saw this quote one time. It says, show me a Bible that's all tore up and I'll show you a person who's not. A lot of truth in that. A whole lot of truth in that. So the sword of the Spirit. The Bible says, in, uh, what is it, Miss Amber, 17? Go back there for me for a minute. The sword of the Spirit, which is... The Word of God. So all the first five pieces of armor, uh, we've had to uh, take time to kind of study to figure out what's the spiritual application to this piece of armor, the, the belt of truth. We had to study to find out where the spiritual application is. The breastplate of righteousness, we had to study to put that together. God's just going to make it real plain and clear for us here. He's going to say, this piece is so important, I'm going to go ahead and tell you exactly what it is. The sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. No guessing what he's talking about here. If anybody tells you anything, it's the sword instead of the Bible, they're lying to you. Because God was real clear here. It's not up for debate what the sword of the Spirit is. We can immediately understand completely what the spiritual application of this armor is because he tells us. The Bible is the only inspired Word of God in existence. I listen to some great preachers. I listen to some great commentators. And, and, and in Bible school, man, I heard some men of God preach some lessons and teach some things, and I'm sitting there with my mouth open like, where, where did they get this from? How did God, I mean, how did they get this out of God's Word? And it's amazing, the things that God has shown them. But the only inspired Word that we'll ever find is the Bible. It's the only document ever written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? Nothing in here is a mistake. Nothing. The part you don't like is not a mistake. The part you do like is not too good to be true. It's all completely inspired. That word inspired... Uh, somebody smarter than me said that it means to feel someone with the urge or ability to do or feel something, especially something created. And another definition for inspired is God breathed. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, the Bible says, All Scripture, all, right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If we need to be patted on the back about something, we'll find it in the Bible. If we needed our tail kicked about something, we'll find it in the Bible. If we need wisdom and learning about something, we will find it in the Bible is what 2 Timothy tells us. When we're faced with spiritual warfare, which we are, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Man, I wish I could get that through my thick skull. I'm trying every day, y'all. I'm just being transparent with you. I'm trying. My wife is not my enemy. She is not my enemy. The, the students in my in, in middle school ministry, as bad as I want to choke them sometimes, they are not my enemy. Y'all are not my enemy. My co-workers, they're not my enemy. My daddy, he's not my enemy. Flesh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
Why can't we get that through our thick head? Instead, we walk around church all sucked up with somebody and won't talk to them. We get around our coworkers uh, at work and, and, and we choose to sabotage them instead of encouraging them. We get in a riff with our spouse about something, we disagree about something, and all of a sudden they're a terrible person, man. What, what in the world? Uh, what, what, what's going on here? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Why do we take spiritual battles and apply them to people? That's not where God told us to be. We wrestle against principalities. We, we wrestle against Satan. And we can use the sword of the Spirit not to fight our spouse, not to fight our friends, not to fight our kids, not to fight our co-workers. We use the sword of the Spirit to fight Satan. And that's it. Let's be clear though. Just because I'm the brand new law enforcement officer and I go out and buy me a shiny silver pistol with an elephant tusk ivory handles on it, and I got my name engraved on the side of, y'all hear me? I got my na name engraved on the side of my nice new sword. Y'all listen. Don't mean nothing if you leave it on the nightstand. Don't mean anything if you leave it in the back dash of the car. Guilty. It don't mean anything if you leave that brand new gun in the, in the wooden box with a glass case under a velvet carpet, the gun's useless. Same is true with our word. At some point, Brett, hold your Bible up, Brett. Hold your sword up. Brett's sword was new one time. Not too long ago that sword was new. Turn it around, Brett, so you can see the front. Man, you got scratches on your sword. How dare you? That's the Word of God. You should take better care of that. It's being used. If it was sitting on the nightstand, it would still look like it did the day you got it. Sitting in church on Sunday, listening to the preacher preach out of the Bible, don't give you the right to think you have a spiritual weapon. Listening to your favorite preacher on the radio on Monday morning so you don't go off on somebody at work. Don't give you the right to think you have, the, have a spiritual weapon you can use. Going to Lifeway, buying one, putting your name on it, uh, putting you, your whole family tree inside of it, and who gave it to you, it don't make you any more owner of, of the sword. Applying that sword, using that sword is what will make that happen. In order for you to be able to claim use of this weapon, you have to practice with it. You have to use it. You have to study it. You have to get to know it inside and out. For my whole life, I have had a reading comprehension problem. I've never been able to, to in school, they make you read three paragraphs and then they take it away from you and make you write a one paragraph synopsis of what you just read. I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't. But if somebody reads to me, or if I can watch it, I can remember it forever. My daddy, every morning that he's not doing something else, which is he makes a point every single morning, he gets up and he reads his Bible. And he studies it. Now, he ain't been doing this 40 years. But don't, don't let me fool you. He's still learning just like all of us. But guess what? My daddy can't read all that well. So you know what he does? He gets his Bible and he lays it in his lap and he gets his iPad. Lord help us, my daddy has an iPad. That is scary. <laughs> but he has figured out how to go to a Bible app and have somebody read it to him. And while that, while that Bible app is reading that Bible to him, he's sitting there reading along with it. We don't have an excuse is what I'm saying. We don't have an excuse not to get in the Word. We don't have an excuse uh, to, to, to not do that. If I have a student come in here uh, and emerge on Wednesday night and they say, I don't have a Bible. Before they leave, they have a Bible. If we ever run out of Bibles out around here, I'll give them my Bible because I can go get another one. But, but if I have one, say, I don't have a Bible, we will make sure they have one. And I hope you do that with people in your life as well. 
We don't have an excuse not to get to know our sword. You have to let it take root in your heart. You have to let it help you to stand firm within your life. You can't be productive with it until you trust it. You, 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 uh, Warren, when they, I know every so often these uh, uh, nozzles on these ends of these fire hoses, they'll come in and offer you all the newest, latest, greatest nozzle that does ten different things and spray water in four different colors and whatever it's going to do. Y'all ain't just going to snap that thing on that inch and three-quarter hose and go out there and start fighting fire with it. No. You're going to say, let me see that thing. Let me make sure it's right. You ain't just going to come throwing something at me and expect me to go out and use it. I want to know if it works the way you say it does. If somebody comes at you and they throw some word at you and they say, this is what God says, I hope you're smart enough to say, uh-uh, come here, let me see that a little closer. Let me make sure you know what you're talking about. Because I'm not putting that on the end of my fire hose and taking my men in a house fire if I don't trust it. Just because somebody tells you something's from the Word of God don't mean it's from the Word of God. And the only way you're going to know if it's from the Word of God or not is if you inspect it and if you look at it and if you know the Word of God yourself. We got to get in there and understand our sword inside and outside 100%. Let it take root in your heart. Let it stand firm in your life. And that way you can be productive in this world, productive against the devil. Hebrews 4.12 the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many of you have heard that verse before? Everybody in here? I'm going to ask you another question. I'll be honest. I don't care if y'all are or not. I'm going to be honest. How many of you have ever only remembered, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? That's what we remember about that verse. We don't remember that last part. Listen to this. I want you to hear this because I've just, I've just heard it for the first time myself and listened to it. Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We can go somewhere else in the Bible and find that our heart is wicked and that we can't trust our heart and that our heart will lie to us. But the Bible is sharp and quick and it's also a discerner of your thoughts. If you're confused about something, go to the Word. If you feel a certain way towards somebody and you know you shouldn't feel that way towards somebody but you can't seem to quit, go to the Word. If you want to love somebody more, if you want to feel a different way about somebody, go to the Word. The answer is right here. And yet we look to Mari and Steve Harvey and Oprah and Joel Osteen and J.B. Brown, D-103, Marriage Matters. Not that that's wrong, because he uses the word. We look to all these places to get answers. But the word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. If you're out, you can do all the outward things you want. God, God worked on me this morning, y'all. Y'all pray for me. I've been dealing with, I'll just tell you, I've been dealing with selfishness. An inward selfish. People say, you're not selfish, man. You stay over there and wash dishes till everybody's gone. And you always here at the church, you always helping. I'm selfish, y'all. I'll admit it. We can spend so much time trying to outwardly prove that we're not selfish. And the whole time inside that disease, that cancer is just burning up inside of us with selfishness. Or whatever your sin may be. Whatever it may be. When we realize that, God will show us that in the Word. He will reveal that to us through 
his word because he knows the intents of the heart. I'm about done. Applying the sword of the Spirit to our life. We've talked about this. This weapon can be used as both a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon. The sword of the Roman soldier, he could hold that thing up to block against a swing that was coming at him. He could, he could take that thing and use it as a pry bar to move things. Or he could swing that joker and chop somebody up. He could use it as a defensive weapon or an offensive. You can do the same. Uh, you can do uh, the same thing with this sword. You can do some damage, buddy. You can put a whooping on the devil with this right here. Y'all understand that? You can put a whoop bull understood what I said. Y'all better understand it. You can put a whooping on the devil with this sword right here. You can do some damage. Do you know what else you can do with it? You can protect yourself. You can protect yourself with this sword. When, when doubt and fear and insecurity and frustration and, and pride and all that stuff start building up inside of you, this is your protection. Your sword is your defensive weapon against all that stuff. I'm going to prove it in a minute. Uh, but it's also when Satan comes at you, you can take a swing every now and then. You take a swing at that joker. You get a good hit. You get a good jab. That word becomes a defensive weapon when we speak it to ourselves and when we remind ourselves of God's promises. Anybody ever have to remind yourself of God's promises? You know them all your life, but when you get in that situation, you need them the most. And you open that scripture that you've read the whole time and it says, do not fear. Do not be anxious. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of those promises. We're still flesh and blood. We're still sinful. So it's necessary to study for ourselves so we can maintain some sort of assurance in Him. It's like medicine. Right? To the soul. If milk does a body good, uh, then the Bible does the soul good. Right? Makes you strong. Staying in that word will keep us standing firm when doubt comes our way. Staying in the a word will keep us standing firm when fear comes our way. Staying in the word will help us uh, stay at that job that we want to leave so bad when, when, when God ain't told us to leave. Staying in the Word uh, will help us uh, take that detour when God says, not right now, maybe later. Staying in the Word uh, will help us maintain our marriages and our relationships when we just really want to give up. Staying in the Word is what's going to help us stand firm when Satan comes against us, when he decides he wants to attack us. And we're using it as a defensive weapon. It becomes an offensive weapon when we remind Satan that he's already defeated. Jesus himself, I, I use this scripture so much, but it's, it's so good. Jesus himself reminded uh, 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 Satan that he was already defeated. And he'd done that uh, with the written word of God when Satan came against him. Turn over to Matthew right quick. We won't be there but a minute, but I'm going to read it. because it's good. What time is it? Ten after? All right, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, I got it on the screen if you, if you can't get there. Let me read that right quick, 1 through 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. He was hangry, y'all. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God... Command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Uh, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
And again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt uh, thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Let me show you something right quick in, verse, uh, in chapter 4 and, and verse 2 uh, to prove to you one thing. Uh, people say, well, yeah, Jesus can do this, but he's the Son of God. Surely he can do that. Let me tell you something. Jesus was just as much man as he was God. Proof is he was hangry. If Jesus was God, he would not be hangry. He went 40 days and 40 nights without any food. He got hungry. Satan comes after you when you're weak. Satan came after Christ when he was weak. And Satan came after Christ and he twisted the scripture just like he did with Eve in the garden. And Satan said to Jesus, well, the Bible says it's okay. The Bible says you can do this. And Jesus come right back at him with Scripture every single time. Three times Jesus used the written Word of God to attack Satan. And then he finally left him alone. There's some hope in that for me and you. Look, when Satan attacks, is not the time to start studying that sword. When Satan attacks, is not the time to get out the grinding stone. When Satan attacks, is not the time to measure and make sure the length's right and the handle fits your hand good. We need to be doing that ahead of time. Jesus had his sword ready to go. He knew what the Word of God said. He knew what needed to be said. And as soon as Satan came to him, he hammered him with it. Had Jesus not known the Word of God immediately uh, at, at, at his command, had he not been able to, uh, to spit that right back at Satan when Satan come at him, that stuff would have sat there and, and turned in his mind. Y'all tell me if I'm lying, but Satan will come tell us stuff and we don't know the answer on how to fight it. And so we sit there and let it spin in our mind and let it work up in our mind. And we over, anybody else in this room overanalyze stuff besides me? I'm sitting there drowning in six inches of water and all I got to do is stand up, right? And here we are in our life uh, 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 just getting the life sucked out of us because we can't fight back with our sword because we don't know what the sword says about the situation. And we go to Maury and we go to Steve Harvey and we go to our, our, our best friend, our blabbermouth friend who's going to go tell everybody on Facebook to be praying for you and all they're really doing is gossiping about you. And, and all we're doing the whole time is digging ourselves deeper. And Satan's just helping us to, to just boil that stuff up in us more and more until finally it boils over. Jesus immediately responded back to Satan with Scripture. He came right back to Satan. And you know what? He was weak when he done it. He wasn't strong. He didn't just graduate Bible school the day before. He was hungry. He was tired. He was cold and wet and scared. That's when he's going to attack you too. And that sword has to be ready. We have the same authority that Jesus has. Can I remind you of that? We have the same authority and the right to fight the enemy with the sword. We're expected to fight the enemy of the sword. But before we can do that, we have to know how to use it. And before we can use it, uh, we have to get it out. We have to get it off the nightstand. We have to crack it open every now and then. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, so why are we not getting prepared? Why are we not studying up, taking the time to learn the ins and outs of the sword, how to use it, when to use it? Because there's no second guessing in that. Let's pray. I hope you've gotten something out of this series like, like I have, and I hope we'll continue to study it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. God, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to, to, to even have your word in English so we can study it and read it. God, everybody in here has access to a Bible, either in the paper form or on their hip. God, we all have the Bible. God, let us study it. Let us learn it. Let us 
uh, be able to, to, to use this sword correctly as a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon to protect ourselves from those principalities and those powers and those demons and, and Satan himself, Father. God, we love you, we thank you, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a good day.